All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another podcast of the Green Speaker Series, where Kennedy Yero and I talk to various different people following different career fields within the conservation um, space. Um, and so today we have Bree Jameson and Sonia Mayer. Um, and Kennedy, did you want to introduce them? I would like for them to introduce themselves today. You know, they come from a unique background high energy, um, great, great, great people, phenomenal, you know, what they're doing as far as, you know, diversifying the field that a lot of you guys that are listening and watching may have never heard of that it actually exists. So, Bree and Sonya, you guys have the floor for your introductions. Okay, I'll go first. My name is Bree Jamison. I'm the chair of the diversity committee for the National Speleological Society, and I'm the founder of More Outside, otherwise known as Minorities in Outdoor Recreation and Education. Uh, my name is Sonia Meyer. Uh, I have several different titles, but I guess most recently I am the newly elected director of the National Speleological Society. And if you're not aware, speleology means the, cut, uh, the study of caves um, and the National Speleological Society, or we'll probably say NSS, is the organization, uh, the national organization that covers the study, the exploration, conservation, education, outreach, all kinds of stuff uh, related to caving. Um, Let's see. And then also locally, I'm the treasurer of my grotto, and we created a diversity scholarship for expedition caving. Awesome. Awesome. That's, That's really cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is cool. So is it possible for me to just say NSS or should I say? Yes. Yeah. I think that'll be good for everyone. <laughs> got you. Got you. Uh, <laughs> and how long has that organization been around? because I've never heard of it before. You know, uh, I believe it was founded in 1941. So that's, let me see, 80 a years? A long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Kitty. A long yeah. time. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow. Um, so my first question to you all, which I think would be, uh, which I imagine is most people's question to y'all, is like, how did you get into, uh, <laughs> Okay, is it speleology? Like you can just say caving. Caving. Okay, I'll say caving. 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 How did it go from you all come to get into caving? <laughs> um, you want to start, Bree? Um, I have a really funny story on how I got into caving. So I actually saw the movie The Descent. I haven't seen the movie. <laughs> You're spoiling it for me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. Watch it anyway. Watch yeah. it when I open, when I closed. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I lost the my connection, I guess, there for a second. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, the movie is just really crazy. And um, I remember watching it and immediately being drawn to um, the scenery and the setting. And I was like, oh, that exists. I need to go there. And so I like started looking it up online and I was like, you know, I'm going to let um, Sonia answer the question and then I'm going to switch over to my uh, cell phone connection and I'll see if that's better. That works. That works. Okay. So Sonia, how did you hear about this field, you know, of caving? Please tell us, you know, elaborate <laughs> on who, who introduced you to this field? Because <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I was in college and I was studying abroad at Oxford University, so I was in England, and caving is much more popular there. Unlike the US, um, if you say caving or potholing, everyone knows what you mean, whereas here they're like, what? Um, so they had a caving club and uh, kind of like Bree said, as soon as I saw it or like knew that that was a thing, I immediately felt this drive like, I need to do that. Um, so I joined the club and the club actually was just drinking at a pub every week, um, but they did organize one caving trip and it was the most fun I had had in my life. 
Um, and then I actually moved to China for three years and didn't think about pursuing it. Um, and when I came back to the US, I always remembered that one experience that I had, you know, several years ago. And like Brie, I started Googling it. I found the NSS and they have a function that says find a grotto near you. And a grotto is like a local chapter of cavers. And so that's usually the entry point into caving is you find a local group um, who will teach you about the skills that you need, um, as well as, you know, take you on trips. Because um, it's, you know, it is a dangerous sport and you have to do it safely. Um, so it's important to have uh, people guide you on that process. So I found my grotto in Virginia where I was living at the time and they were very welcoming. I started caving at first once a month and then it just kind of increased till where I was caving every weekend. And then I found myself caving every weekend for two years until COVID. <laughs> so yeah, it just kind of um, ramped up and I just didn't stop from there. Um, and are there a lot of grottos in the U.S. or is it kind of more so where it might be like one per like uh, state or region or something like that? There are a lot of grottos. It depends on your area. So I lived in the D.C. area and now I live in the Bay Area. So big mo metropolitan areas can have multiple grottos. So in both cases, there's three different grottos. So I kind of interacted with all of them. But in some other areas, there might be one. Um, I think Bree is in the Bexar Grotto in Houston, is that right? Or San Antonio? So I'm in the Bear Grotto in San Antonio, and then um, I'm also a member of the Underground Texas Grotto in Austin, because I tend to go to Austin, between like Austin and San Antonio, quite a bit for like rock climbing and acro yoga, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the grotto, there's more grottos in areas that have more caves, obviously, so like the state of Montana, which is not a very populous area has one grotto for the whole state and oh, they wow. have wow. online meetings and then they have a once a year get together so it, it's very regional specific got you i can appreciate this terminology too because this is all new to me a grotto you know we're using yeah. different terminology so yeah. i'm kind of feeling like okay this is a community that now i can start researching myself <laughs> to see what's here in atlanta when you say a grotto is that something like a is it like an affinity group, like a secret society, fraternity, soror? Like, what exactly do you it's have to do to, can you Google a grotto? Do you have to know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they are, they're a little bit secretive. And the reason why is because cave conservation is very important. You know, when you think about the world, the natural world above ground, things change and recover much more quickly than they do underground. So for example, a stalagmite underground, it grows at the rate of 10 centimeters every thousand years. So some stalagmites are like 190,000 years old. And for that reason, you really need to protect those environments. You know, above ground, you can chop down a tree it'll grow back in a few years. Underground, <laughs> or on the scale of like tens of thousands of years. Um, so for that reason, there is a little bit of secrecy in the effort to protect these extremely delicate and important environments. Um, so I think that's an issue for the NSS and the cave and cultures balancing secrecy and conservation and protection and then inclusivity and welcoming new people. Um, but there's a, there's a good reason behind it. Um, but yeah, so the local, you can think of them as like clubs. So they're local chapters of people that are passionate about caving and each one is unique. Mine will have a monthly meeting where we have a presentation about something related to the field of speleology. And then we organize trips throughout the year. And we, we always try to have beginner friendly trips for new people. Um, and then obviously advanced trips for the people that have been around for a while. Gotcha. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Bree, yeah, we're back up and rolling, I see. We are back. We would love to hear, you know, a backstory on how you were introduced to this field, you know, this space. Okay, so um, as I was saying, I got started caving because I watched the movie The Descent with my family. 
And when I saw the movie, I was just so drawn to the setting that I immediately started doing research to find out, find out how I could get involved and how I could get underground. And I remember my family, so I'm black. And the first thing that my family said was, black people don't do that. And I thought to myself, here we go, yet another thing that I wanna try. And my family's like, we don't do this thing, which kind of motivated me even more. That's just kind of, you know, my spirit. And so um, I decided to go and find where the meetings were happening. I found the Bear Grotto, which is San Antonio's local caving club. And um, they were having these bi-monthly meetings. And so I went to a meeting and I was so excited and I walk in and I tend to be a very high energy person as it is. And so I walk in with all this energy and excitement and this very, very white group turns around like in unison. And it was almost like someone like stopped a record and like everyone was staring at me and it was really awkward. And so I like very bubbly, you know, walked in and said hi and sat down. And I was waiting for the meeting to, you know, continue. And for like a solid, like 10 to 15 seconds, there was like nothing. It was like really awkward. Um, but everyone was really warm and welcoming and very interested in this new person who didn't look like them. Um, you know, and so my very first night going to a meeting, I got invited underground. And so I was like, I went home and I remember telling um, my husband at the time, I was like, hey, so I got invited to this meeting or to this, this cave trip, like I have to go. And he was like, okay, but like, you really don't know these people. And like, we just saw that there were aliens under there that were eating people. Are you sure you want to do this? Like we have twin boys. Like my kids were like two at the time. And so he was like, you know, we, I don't know if this is the safest thing for you. And I was like, no, 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 it'll be fine. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And he was like, Exhibit A, like, let's look at the movie again. <laughs> and, and so I was like, no, 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 that was just the movie. Like, I've got to try this. So I get ready to go to this meeting and I've got on like, you know, typical Splunker gear. And Sonia and I will explain the difference between Splunkers and Cavers later. But I look like a total Splunker and I go and I meet up with these guys and there's this cave literally in the middle of the city, surrounded by a subdivision. And we go and drive into this alleyway. And I mean, it's, it's nighttime. It's like eight o'clock on a weeknight. And we drive into this alleyway. We, they give me this gear to put on, like all this safety gear. So we gear up in the dark behind all these people's houses. And I'm with like a group of maybe like, I think it was like four or five very big burly white men. Yeah. And I'm not a very large person. And they're like, okay, the sinkhole's over there. So we don our headlamps and we start walking into the sinkhole and I'm literally walking in the ground, like into the ground with this group of white men that I just met the night before. And everything in my body is telling me, like, it was almost as if like, have you ever seen a movie? And like, as you're watching the movie, you're like, oh my gosh, like, don't do that. Don't go in there. Yeah. I was experiencing yeah. that. And then I was like, <laughs> This is crazy, like, and, but I did it anyway, and I had the most amazing time, and I fell in love with caving, and I've seen some of the most beautiful natural formations that I'd ever seen in my entire life, and I was hooked ever since then, so. <laughs> wow, wow, to go from that warm embrace with people that have no clue as far as, you know, your background, um, that don't even look like you, to be, yeah. you know, frank, and you're going in a cave. <laughs> which I will assume that there is no cell reception or anything in a no. cave. No. So that's At very night too. <laughs> that's very <laughs> For that to be your introduction to, you know, this space, that's very courageous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so I wanted to ask, um, so like how, how, how do you know when to when to turn around? Because um, I would imagine that like a lot of these natural cave formations that they can just keep going and going. So when you're down there, um, is there ever a point where you just get like, nah, that's too far. I'm not going anymore. 
Maybe spunkers do. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you explain that term, Bree? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. So please, because I have no clue what that is. And I've heard you guys use that terminology too. I'm making a mental note, spunkers. <laughs> So um, it's just a, a cute little term that we affectionately use. So most people, when they think of caving and they want to try it for the first time, they think, oh, I want to go splunking. Um, and they think that they're a splunker. And there is a saying in the caving community that cavers rescue splunkers. And so cavers, we kind of, you know, regard ourselves as the experts. We're the people that will make sure that we take all of the safety precautions plus more. And, you know, we do it in the, for the sake of conservation and science and our recreation is always responsible. Um, as opposed to splunkers who are typically unprepared, don't know a whole lot, they're kind of in over their head before they even step foot in the cave um, and usually require rescue from people like us. So it's just, you know, one of those little things. Yeah, one good example is like, cavers always wear helmets in a cave and a spelunker would probably not wear a helmet. <laughs> yeah. Um, and sort of along those lines, um, so I assume that then cavers are the ones who actually like go in and map out the tunnels. Um, mm -hmm. And then I believe like I had an experience like a while ago where we went to a mountain and went into um, a cave. And so mm -hmm. I also assume that like cavers are the ones who set up like this is where it's safe to walk and this is where you don't go unless you want to be stuck down here for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you both are doing volunteer work, but is that something or an aspect of the um, caving expedition that you've had to do where you're down there like exploring uncharted territories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can talk about this. Um, I Last year, I spent three months on expeditions. And again, it is not paid work. <laughs> um, uh, usually when people become so obsessed with caving that they devote their lives to it, we call them cave bums. So I became a cave bum last year where I worked as a substitute teacher. So I kind of made um, enough money to buy gear, to buy, um, you know, travel and pay for food so that I could go off on these expeditions. And um, yeah, we you know, we map the caves out. Um, mapping a cave is really important for resource management. You know, if you don't know where the caves go, how can you manage your resource? So in terms of when you think of like federal caves, like Carlsbad Caverns, Wind Cave, you know, the national parks. And there's also caves on a lot of federal land like BLM, um, the National Forest. So they all need um, their caves to be mapped so that they can manage their resources. Um, but on top of that, on top of the mapping, there's also a lot of science that happens on expeditions. And this is kind of where you start to get into some of the career fields in speleology, um, but they are pretty niche. So like um, geology, obviously, um, hydrology, which is the study of water. Um, and that, I'm not an expert in that, um, but that one is pretty important. And a, a very profitable career field. So that's something I did think about at one point. And then biology, I know a bit more about um, because I did work at Carlsbad Caverns last summer. And um, they have a cave there called Lechigia that's, um, I want to say it's, it's over 150 miles long. So it's a big cave. So when you talk about turning back, that's definitely one where you need to think about that. Um, Cause there are some caves that are like a hundred feet long. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in Lechaguia, it has a really unique environment in that it was isolated from the outside world for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So it was only found maybe five, decades ago and someone did a dig where they were removing rocks and they ended up finding this giant cave. And so think about a natural environment that had no access to human bacteria and our, you know, all the things that are in our world. So it effectively was an alien environment underground. Um, so that has really interesting implications for um, microbial research. Um, they've been doing research there to find, um, you know, hopefully cures for cancer, um, you know, bacteria that can fight um, antibiotic resistant superbugs, things like that. Um, and then there's also paleoclimate research because um, 
stalagmites are formed by water dripping, you know, from the surface through the ground to these underground environments. And they, every drip will place like a little bit of um, carbonate, calcium carbonate. And so over hundreds of thousands of years, these stalagmites grow. And basically what you have inside this stalagmite is a record of weather patterns for like hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so that's really important in terms of climate research that's going on nowadays and uh, global warming and things like that. That is incredible. That's actually like blowing my mind the it amount is. of science that it goes is. in the yeah. caving and the amount of useful information that we get out of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kenny. No, go ahead. Go ahead, finish what you were saying. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so my first stupid question was stalagmites are the one on the ceiling and stalactites are the one on the floor, correct? Let's oh, is it the other way? Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> reverse, reverse. <laughs> so, so stalactites hang tight to the ceiling. Stalagmites might reach the ceiling. Oh, oh that's clever. Thank you. And then when they touch, you've got a column. <laughs> yes. That's cool. <laughs> oh, so in preparation, oh, we keep. Oh, no, because <laughs> I know we both got a bunch of questions. So you yeah, because I am being like, my mind is blown right now. I'm loving this right now. <laughs> oh, well, I'll go ahead. So in preparation yeah, for so. something like an expedition, Bree and Sonya, feel free to speak up. But as far as the technology and tools that are needed, is it, I don't know, cranes and stuff going in first and making sure that, this, you know, is it super safe before you guys go in? you know, as individuals with your tools or how does that even look? Can someone paint that picture for us, please? Yeah, I can talk about that. So um, actually the tools that cavers use are not that sophisticated. Um, we mostly go in with headlamps. When you're mapping the cave, um, you can, the older technology was to use like an, just an actual compass, an inclinometer, and then a tape measure. So it's pretty old school, but more modern technology exists called a disto, and it's just a little point and shoot, and with like it has a laser, and with one shot you can get those three measurements um, immediately. Um, but in terms of the mapping of it, it's still mostly done by people, especially because um, there just isn't the money for the smaller caves to use the more advanced technology lidar does exist and is used to map caves, but it's pretty expensive and time consuming. So Carl's Unless you make your own. <laughs> have you done that? <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. We're creating a cave <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Yeah, so um, uh, LIDAR has been done in Carlsbad Caverns and some of the more um, significant cave systems. So that does exist. And um, there is research going on right now to try to create an autonomous vehicle that can go through caves. Um, DARPA, which I forget the exact acronym, um, but it's like a government military research agency. Um, they actually put a call out a couple years ago asking for people to develop these autonomous vehicles to move through caves. And I think most of the designs are a drone. Um, and they, as I understand it, they want to eventually um, I mean, it's probably secret what they're really doing with it, but they are trying to create these vehicles to explore the caves on Mars. Um, so there's a lot of like really interesting ways that this research can be used. Um, but I want to hear about Bree's experience with the Cavatron because that sounds super cool. <laughs> so there's a um... It, it's there's a benefit to being in various grottos like each grotto has like various things that they're really good at and um, here in San Antonio we've got Southwest Research Institute um, and we have a lot of amazing little tech nerds who are able to create these cool things for us here um, and so between the underground Texas grotto and the bear grotto um, we've got some brilliant um, technologists and engineering minds um, so, for instance, like one of our um, grotto members in the underground Texas grotto is an aerospace engineer who is creating this artificial intelligence um, kind of drone that will go to like the moons of Europa and be able to try to find out if there's life beneath the ice crust. 
Um, and so they're testing some of these technologies in the caves of Florida um, to kind of recreate some of those um, environments. And so that's really cool. And then also there's um, one of our members was able to create the cave which is kind of like um, a device that instead of um, going in and having, you know, to send cavers to physically and manually map out the caves, you go in, you put it in the center of a room and it's able to um, find, it's able to see all of the walls and kind of give you um, a virtual uh, map of the cave and then you can go and print it out. And so for like our, our grotto meetings, like last year, I think we had um, uh, a 3D printout of one of the caves, which was really cool. And that was made possible because of technology like that. Yeah, it was like our white elephant. I was like, oh, why didn't I win that? <laughs> But um, <laughs> yeah, so so things like that, and that technology is public, not uh, public, uh, publicly accessible. So, um, you know, you can take that technology and go and build your own, and it's much more affordable. And so, um, you know, having one person on the on your team who has something like that available, and you know, there may be another person who you know brings other gear, but. Um, as a team, just to talk about what, what Sonia was um, speaking on, as far as like what tools we use, um, everyone kind of just comes together and brings everything. We pool all of our various knowledge and tools together to get these caves mapped, to find out what kind of cave biology is there, to study the hydrogeology, and so just to get the job done. Mm -hmm. wow, That's awesome, that man. Thank you for making that, for painting that picture for us as well. And this may be a stupid question. You know, like I said, I'm still learning about this community. You guys are doing a great job of enlightening, you know, our viewers and our listeners, you know, on what to expect and, you know, very, very informal as far as, you know, what caving is. So do you guys actually run into people who are, quote unquote, doing it for the wrong, I wouldn't say wrong reasons, but they have a different agenda when it comes to caving. Let's say, for example, someone's caving for different gems of gold or oil or, you know, for for their own personal gains versus preserving, you know, the nature of, you know, what exactly, you know, it is here that's underground and, you know, the history and research behind it. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say, um... I have a couple times run across people or groups that will uh, try to turn caving into like a commercial business and charge people to go caving. And I would say that's kind of frowned upon in the caving community. You know, we all do this for our passion and love. And most grotto, like I would say all grottos would never charge you money to learn a skill or to go on a caving trip. And in fact, some will probably try to cover costs by giving you gear or giving you a ride. Um, that being said, like I try not to be too judgmental of people that do charge money because I think some people might feel more comfortable like if they think that money is being exchanged, they might feel safer. And if that's how they need, if they need that reassurance to go into that scary environment, you know, um, I don't know. But yeah, I would just say generally that the idea of charging money and doing it commercially is kind of frowned upon. Yeah. Um, and I had another question in regards to the conservation aspect of caving. Um, cause I know you mentioned like finding caves that haven't been exposed to basically like our atmosphere within like a hundred thousand years. Um, so I guess mine was kind of a two parter was first of all, like when you go into a new cave system like that, I imagine you can't wear like a hazmat suit to prevent like <laughs> contamination or anything like that. Um, so like what sort of gear do you have to wear to protect that ecosystem? Um, and then the second part of that question would be when you have caves like these that, are, that you are trying to protect, what are like the general measures that go into conserving that environment? I think so this would be I, a great time to talk about white nose. I don't know if you want to take that, Brie. It would be a great time to talk about white nose. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about um, the, uh, the, the, the easier side of it. And then I'll let you talk about white nose because I know that you've done work with that part of conservation. Um, so as far as protecting the caves, 
Um, we, it, it varies. It based on, it, it's all based on what kind of cave you're going to. For instance, um, there's one cave um, that, you know, has a beautiful, pristine calcite formation um, that, that kind of resembles a river. And so in that particular cave, you have to wear clean socks. So you take off your dirty, muddy cave boots. And in order to walk near that formation, you put on fresh, clean socks, and then you walk past it. And then when you're going out, um, then you know, you can don your, your boots again. But um, that's just like one thing that we do. We always wear gloves um, because the oils from our hands will actually stop the growth of formations. So like Sonia was explaining, um, these formations that are in the caves are take thousands of years to be formed. And so um, that's because they don't have, you know, some of the things from our world. Um, uh, to kind of be a part of that that growth process. And so we always wear gloves when we go in caves. Um, you know, it's, it, most caves are a lot cooler than the surface. Um, there are some hotter caves, but most of the caves are a lot cooler. And so um, even when we're in there, you know, you're, you're physically exerting yourself, so you're gonna be sweating. So, you know, we always make sure that we wear the appropriate clothing and attire when we go in. Um, we make sure that we tread lightly um, we always pl practice like extreme leave no trace, um, you know, with the national parks um, or any outdoor space um, that you want to preserve. You want to always try to leave no trace. And there's a whole list of rules that you can follow, but it's even more extreme when you go underground. Um, whatever we take in, we take out. Um, if we go in and we see, you know, anything that shouldn't be there that, you know, may have been left by splunkers, um, then we'll make sure to pull it out and do any restoration that's necessary. Um, but there are things that require more protection. Um, for instance, like um, a lot of the biology in caves. And so there um, is a really big issue called white nose syndrome that's impacting um, the bats that are found in these caves. And I'll let Sonia talk about that, but um, it's a really interesting scenario that we're dealing with. Yeah, so um, white nose syndrome is a fungus that came to the U.S. I want to say in 2010. So it's been around for over a decade. Um, and it, what it does is that it infects the bats and it creates this white fungus on their noses. So that's why it's called white nose syndrome. And it tickles their nose and it makes them wake up during hibernation. So bats hibernate in the winter. If they wake up it, they will be hungry and they'll fly out of the cave looking for food, but it's winter, there's no food, and so they die. Um, it's very contagious. Um, bats, most bats, um, I don't know what the right term is, but they, they're in like these tiny little huddles, like you'll have a one by one, you know, a foot roost. space, and that's like a of bats. A roost, yeah. So they roost in like very tight quarters, so basically it spreads very quickly. And then they also migrate, which means that it spreads as well when the bats go from cave to cave. Um, so it first came to the U.S. about a decade ago, and shortly after it came, it decimated bat populations all over the eastern U.S. Like it, was, it was quite devastating. And another thing that I don't know if many people know, but bats are really good for us, <laughs> for humans, for the and um, they're natural pollinators, um, you know, of, our, of the world. They eat pests, so they save like thousands and thousands of dollars in agriculture. If we had more bats, we wouldn't need pesticides, then our food would be healthier. So like, there's so many benefits to bats. <laughs> um, and they were decimated. So it was a very bad thing. Um, and they were concerned that humans were contributing to the spread of this disease. So one of the restrictions to prevent the spread of white nose is that um, you, they kind of organize it by states, but you know, whatever, um, if you cave in one state, you cannot bring that gear into another state, into a cave. Um, so you either have completely separate sets of gear or you go through this very um, like lengthy sanitization process. Um, so I usually, if I do it, I do actually have multiple sets of gear because I'm pretty invested in caving. Um, but if you wanted to, 
Um, you use like hot water, uh, Lysol will kill the fungus, and then UV as well. So I do all three. Um, yeah, so that's an example of being careful with the biology and things that you don't even think about. Like something as harmless as like, oh, I'm going caving in West Virginia, now I'm in Texas. That actually can be harmful. Um, so that's why education about conservation is important. Um, wow. But in, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Um, in terms of your original question about those like totally alien environments like Lechuguilla, that's actually really rare. And that's why Lechuguilla is such a prized place to do research because it, it's so rare to have that. Most caves are open, like have big entrances. So, you know, there's, and baths come in and out. So there is like uh, microbes from the outside going inside. Um, and some caves have water flowing through it. So you have that transition um, from the above ground world to the underground world. So Leche Gia is definitely an unusual case and another reason why it's so important to protect it. That's great. That's great. We appreciate you elaborating on that. I wanted to switch the conversation just a bit because I graduated from an HBCU. And for those that are listening, don't know what an HBCU is, that's a historically black college and university. And it's a huge myth that black and brown people do not get outside. That's a lie. <laughs> that is a huge myth. And to even take it a little bit further to caving that space, that was never introduced to my community. Um, no one came to my college and spoke about it, set up a table, no one sent out emails. I've never heard any of my peers speaking about caving or anybody that I've come in contact with besides you, Sonia. And that was, you know, meeting you in DC. That's the first time that I ever heard about it. So what is the, it may be a three-part question and, you know, feel free to just chime in and chat and let's have great dialogue about it as far as, you know, diversifying the field. How do we engage, you know, black and brown communities and, you know, what is it going to take to to see more people that looks like you know me if that makes you know us feel comfortable in that space now what is it going to take um i'll take this one sonia if you don't mind yeah go for it this is something that i am extremely extremely passionate about um diversifying outdoor spaces um so um to, to answer your question, um, I'll, I'll start with the beginning um, or, or your last question. What would it take to see more um, underrepresented communities involved in caving um, and other outdoor recreation? And it's really going to take more equity um, in those spaces. You have to understand, I'll use my, my experience as an example. So when I first introduced myself to caving, I knew nothing about it. And so I didn't have any gear and I was um, raising toddlers. And so um, I had to think about, you know, whether or not one, I had the time to go caving. I had to think about my transportation to the caves. I had to think about the money that I would need to spend on getting to the caves. I had to think about whether or not I was able to go to the meetings because it was held in a restaurant. I had to think about all of those things. And while fortunately I was able to participate, I know plenty of people who are in underrepresented communities that due to systemic oppression are not able to participate in activities for those specific reasons. Um, and so I think that what you have to think about is making outdoor spaces, including our underground spaces, more equitable for everyone. And then once you decide to make them more equitable, meaning uh, read accessibility, right? Um, once you do that, then you also have to start thinking about how you can make people feel welcome and, and, and involve inclusion in your conversations. So, um, for instance, one of the things that, you know, you can do, um, and I'll use an example of like a recent grotto meeting. So we have, um, a lot of people who are finally comfortable enough, um, coming out and so their sexuality may not be the normal gender binary. Um, and so I think that, you know, because of that, some of the things that we can do are like using, uh, introducing ourselves with pronouns. So just 
you know, that's one thing. Um, but thinking along those lines of what can I do to make people feel welcome that is beyond, hi, come and do this with me. Um, because while we may think that we're being welcoming, um, interpretation is far more important than intentions. Um, so th that's, you know, another thing that I can think of. Um, I think that in the caving space, um, what we first need to do before we start working on those things, though, is challenging our own internal culture. Um, and that's not to say that something is wrong with our internal culture. It's just to say that there's always room for improvement when you're talking about diversity. Um, as we have seen, you know, in so many different parts of today's society. Um, so when it comes to caving, challenging our own culture, making sure that these conversations are being had with people who never, ever, ever, ever have to be the only person like them in a room or in a group, um, you know, making sure that they're aware of the things that we have to think about all the time. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's good work. It's work that makes you feel good when you start making progress, even if that progress is small. Um, and Bree, um, I just had a follow-up question for you. Um, so I know you mentioned uh, when we were, you were watching the movie, The Descent with your parents, that they said, you know, that's something that black people don't do. Have you like heard any more of that since you started caving? And like, if you've told people about it, have you heard like any of that? Like, oh, we don't do that type of pushback. So I literally hear that all the time. Um, so caving is one of my passions. It's very, very close to me. Um, but I often find myself personally, find myself personally in a lot of situations where I'm the only black person in the, in the room or in the group. Um, I'm a rock climber, I'm, I cave, I do acro yoga, um, you know, I go skiing, I, I'm a kayaker, like I do all these things. And so I'm constantly finding myself in these situations where, you know, people will make comments like, oh, you know, that's so cool that you're doing that. I don't usually see people like you doing that. Um, and I know what that means. Or I will, in my work with more outside, I'll try to take underrepresented communities outdoors to do these activities. And oftentimes I'll hear, no, we don't do that. That's some white people stuff. And I think that, you know, as a black outdoors person, you know, kind of hearing that over and over again um, is one of those internal stigmas that we have to work on um, as, as a culture, in our own culture, um, because we do. We absolutely do. And it's not lost on me that minorities have historically experienced the outdoors in, in a much, much different light than our white counterparts. Um, the outdoors have always been for recreation when it comes to most white cultures. And when it comes to most minority cultures, it's always meant labor or, you know, something else and you know maybe perhaps it was a part of you know their fight for freedom um and so it just doesn't have the same connotation um when when we think about it um so i think that reintroducing these activities to um minority communities underrepresented communities in a light that helps them to responsibly and comfortably enjoy these spaces is key um, I know that I can't take a group of young black children to a water cave because statistically, most of them may not know how to swim. And so you have to meet people where they are. Um, so yes, I, while I hear that all the time, I'm constantly combating that, that phrase that, you know, that we don't do that. Um, because we do, we absolutely can't. There's, there's nothing that says that we can't. And I think it's important to put ourselves in those situations. Um, and it's okay to, you know, to, to be the first. It's okay to be alone because you'll soon realize that you're not alone. Um, every other black caver that I've ever met, and there are black cavers out there, mm -hmm. um, has each of us, and it's so uncanny, Hang on, you muted. Uh, -oh. uh oh. You 
said is so uncanny. That's the last thing that was said. Okay. So um, I was saying that um, it's just, it's so uncanny that we all had this exact same experience. We started caving. We thought that we were the only black cavers because all of the white cavers around us told us we've never, ever seen another black caver. And so we were all convinced that we were just these, you know, little black unicorns frolicking underground. And then, you know, eventually we realized, and, and they all did the same thing. They all looked it up, black caver. And the first thing that you find is like, the historic cavers who discovered and, um, you know, basically uh, created most of the, the routes that we go on today and the, the, uh, the commercial tours at Mammoth Cave, so Stephen Bishop um, and those guides. And so, you know, you see these historic figures and you're like, yeah, but what about cavers nowadays? Are there any, you know, cavers that look like me now? And thanks to the, you know, constant connectivity of the internet you know we're able to find each other and um share experiences but yeah there we're, we're we're out there we do do this <laughs> man that's awesome that is awesome is it safe for me to say that you guys are now friends partners allies of gyf and this podcast is going to get a lot of interaction so i would love to see if we can create some type of a pipeline to where when we receive those questions, comments from a lot of, you know, people from these underrepresented communities, is it safe to redirect them to you too, Bri and Sonia, just to make sure that they're getting the right information? Yes, <laughs> definitely. I would love that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate you guys. Also, you know, we've spoken about gear so many times. Um, I want to shout out our partners, Jack Wolfskin, North America. And at the end of this call, I definitely want to send these 10, 40% off coupons from their company to YouTube, to you guys, you know, so you can utilize however you feel. You can, you know, pass them out to your community. Like it's totally up to you guys. And I want to get your address because I want to send both of you guys some gear as well that we receive from our yearly gear drive from our partners like Merrill, the North Face, Cotopaxi, Vibram Shoes, REI, Man, the list goes on. If I forgot somebody, please, you know, forgive me. But it's just one of those things where we definitely want to show love and extend a sense of gratitude to you all for sharing your time with us today. This has been one of the my favorites, honestly, one of my favorite <laughs> podcasts that I've done this year. And I had no clue about caving, splunking, any of that. You know, I've even learned new terms to utilize. You know, yeah. since yeah, <laughs> since the podcast started today. So I definitely want to connect with you guys offline, get your address and you know, email these goods out and send, you know, these things in the mail to you all as well. So are you saying that we'll be able to get you underground, Kennedy? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy, you're in Atlanta, right? I am. I am in Atlanta. I am. You're in a caving hot spot. Did you know that? I did not. I wasn't aware of it at all. I wasn't aware. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kenny, it sounds active. like we got a GYF trip we need to plan. We do. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That would we'll make a great video. <laughs> uh, and Yero, uh, before we wrap up, did you have anything that you wanted to ask? Um, I guess I just wanted to ask, basically, since you guys pay attention so much to the biology that goes on within caves, um, where do you think that the next generation can devote their attention to when it comes to caving? Did you say when it comes to caving or cave science? Caving, yes. Okay. Hmm. That's a good question. I think one area um, would be more outreach education. So for instance, one of the things in conservation that we're dealing with um, presently in our area are developers wanting to um, build and you know, create you know, more human footprint in areas um, where caves are. And it's very, it's caves create these very, very delicate ecosystems. Um, and, you know, a lot of them have pristine springs and waters um, that we really don't want to disrupt. And a lot of the biology that thrive in these environments um, are at risk um, when development 
begins to happen. And so I think that if we're able to educate the public about these things um, in, a, in a broader way, then we can avoid some of, you know, the fights that we're having now. And so in the future, I think that the more awareness about cave conservation that we're able to um, kind of get out there, then the better off we'd be. So that's probably something that the next generation can focus on that we're already kind of pushing in that, in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I guess one more question that I would have is if there's a starter cave that you would recommend for anyone who's getting into caving, what would it be? That depends on your area. I think if you wanted to get into caving, I would go on to the NSS website, caves.org, and do the find a local grotto, and you can just put in like your address or your town, and it'll tell you the nearest grotto to you. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's the best way to get started is to find a grotto near you, and then they'll be able to tell you a beginner cave in your area that's appropriate. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's all that's left to add. Any closing remarks? Anything you guys want to share? Any nuggets you want to drop on us in closing? I'm just, I don't know, I'm really passionate about caving. I love caving and the idea of getting more people underground and helping them understand these amazing environments is very exciting to me. So I'm really happy that we did this podcast. If any viewers out there are interested, um, I don't know if you have some, you can contact UIF and send them our way, but um, the caving community is very um, welcoming. And, you know, if you come my way, I'll definitely connect you with people in your area. Go ahead and plug yourself, plug your social media, whatever it needs for them to get in contact with you. Go ahead and plug yourself. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, our website is caves.org. It's being redesigned this year, which we're very excited about. Um, I don't know. What's the best way to get in contact, you think, Bree? I'll give so my person. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that the best way is to, um, everyone's on social media nowadays, and we are getting better at it. But right now, you can reach us on Facebook um, at National Speleological Society. Um, I know that that's a, a lot, but um, we also have a National Speleological Society community on Facebook that's pretty active. Um, and just don't be afraid to reach out. I know that, you know, when you first get into caving, you, you don't quite know exactly where to go. But um, if this is something that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to learn more, then don't be shy. Go to thecaves.org, find your local grotto, reach out. Um, there are people who would be happy. We are, everyone that you meet in caving is going to be just as excited about it as Sonia and I are. We are not <laughs> unique in that. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when people are excited about things, they want to share it. And so just reach out and don't be afraid to try something new because you will not regret it at all. Love it, love it, love it, love it. I definitely wanted to take the time to acknowledge um, Representative John Lewis and his past. And we definitely want to send our condolences out to his family, friends, and loved ones. Um, he's a huge advocate for, you know, the outdoor community and spaces as well. So we definitely wanted to tell you, you know, we love you, brother. And, you know, sending our sincerest condolences out to his family, friends, and loved ones. Thank you. And thank you again, Sonia and Bree, for being on our podcast. We know that you all are super busy. So we just really want to take the time to thank you for really just educating us on what caving is and what the science looks like, what you do, and just like that entire process. Because I think that's something that really none of us at our organization really knew too much about. So this has been really informative. And honestly, I feel like we could like start a class just on caving and like what that is and, you know, just educate <laughs> the masses, you know? Um, We're working yeah. on that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. If you guys actually want to do that, definitely let me know uh, or let us yeah. know. Oh, yeah. that would be really cool. All right. Well, it looks like we might we might have something uh, yeah. in the works then. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. But all righty. Thank you all for being on our podcast today. Um, I see it's eight o'clock. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and wrap up. We didn't want to keep you all too long. So this was awesome. This is definitely one of my favorite podcasts as well. 
You know, we might need to do a second one because I still got more questions. <laughs> <laughs> we should yeah. do a follow up after we get you guys to underground. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Sonia, I hear a trip See, to Kenny, tag. you probably have one at Snow Mountain. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, if this COVID is over, I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I want y'all to take me to one of y'all's fancy caves too. I want to see like all the all the all the untouched Elephant? earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But all righty, folks, that will do it for this episode of the Green Speaker series. Um, you can check us out at YouTube, and we also have our playlist on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts as well. So, yeah, please share this within your networks. Big thank you to Sonia and Bree, and that'll be all for today, folks. So thank y'all, and take care. Bye-bye. Have, have a great one. one.